um, and we'll hear from the state agencies. And I know they've sat here and they've listened to everything everyone's saying. So um, we want to hear about your work with black-owned businesses. We have Ted. Can you give Eli your last? Eliopoulos. Yeah. Eliopoulos <laughs> and, Lori, and Lori Weir <laughs> from CalPERS and Cynthia Bridges from the Board of Equalization. You have 10 minutes to share with us about CalPERS, and Cynthia, you have 10 minutes to share BOE. Terrific. Committee chairs? Yes, thank you so much. Get and started. members? Can I start? Yes, go ahead and start. Uh, my name is Ted Eliopoulos. I'm the Chief Investment Officer for CalPERS. It's a real honor to be uh, invited to be here today to discuss the state of black enterprises in California and specifically CalPERS and how we support the development of black enterprises through our investments, specifically through our Emerging Manager Program and diversity and inclusion initiatives. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm joined by Lori Weir. Uh, Lori manages our targeted investment programs, which oversees our Emerging Manager Programs, which you'll hear much in our testimony, testimony here today about. Uh, to begin with some context, CalPERS serves more than 1.7 million members in our retirement system and administers benefits for 1.4 million members and their families in our health programs. Uh, CalPERS total fund market value uh, as of this last fiscal year, which is closed, is a little over $300 billion. This makes us the largest pension fund in the United States. And over the course of our 80 years, CalPERS has built retirement and health security for state, school, and public agency members who invest their life work for public service. Uh, given uh, uh, the majority, I just mentioned, the majority of our retirement benefit payments, about 67 cents of every dollar are funded through the work of the investment office and our investment earnings. Given the importance of our investment earnings to fund the benefits that have been promised now and into the future, uh, our duty is to maximize the investment returns, to minimize the, the risk of losses within the program, and uh, manage the portfolio at the lowest possible cost basis. That's my job as the Chief Investment office, Officer and our job as the Investment Office. Uh, turning to uh, look at how CalPERS can advance uh, black enterprises in California, uh, clearly, one of the key ways CalPERS uh, can do this is by working with investment management firms with black ownership. Uh, and in this regard, for over 20 years, CalPERS has been a national and really international leader uh, in investing with emerging managers. And we'll talk more about uh, what that is uh, as we go along. Uh, Emerging managers is how we re refer to uh, newer managers that fall below a certain uh, threshold either of assets under management. Uh, frequently that number is about $2 billion is, uh, is the threshold. Uh, it varies within different asset classes. Uh, but basically our emerging manager initiatives help us create relationships with smaller firms. And oftentimes uh, these smaller firms include, include women and minority owned firms. Um, earlier in the earlier testimony today, we heard reference to Prop uh, 209, which does pose uh, challenges uh, to how we craft our investment programs. But I'm really uh, pleased to say that our emerging manager program has uh, led us uh, to uh, be able to invest many billions of dollars of investments with women and minority-owned investment firms. Uh, in fact, we have currently uh, approximately $12 billion invested with emerging managers and another $3 billion in new commitments to our emerging manager strategies over the next five years. And I want to emphasize, as, as the previous speakers uh, have made the point, there's a strong business case for this work uh, that we do at CalPERS. Uh, simply put, CalPERS believes that early stage fund managers uh, have strong potential for success and that increasing the diversity of our investment talent provides us opportunities that we might not otherwise have access to or might be overlooked by systems of our size uh, throughout the country. Uh, 
Uh, we also believe that emerging manager programs help develop the next generation of investment talent that will be able to manage our larger commitments of capital into the future. An important element of this plan that I'd like to underscore is the creation of a new program within our emerging manager program that we announced uh, just months ago, and that's the creation of a manager transition program. Uh, which for the first time will provide an identified pathway for emerging managers uh, to grow beyond uh, the size and limits of our emerging manager program to become an established uh, manager. Uh, specifically, we're creating opportunities for up to 15 firms uh, that are currently classified as emerging managers in our program that we believe will be able to uh, manage larger capital commitments. I was particularly pleased to hear Mr. James earlier today talk about the need in the context of a small business program for a transition program, and we certainly agree, agree with that. Uh, to underscore our commitment there, we are planning for a commitment of up to $7 billion to these 15 firms within the private equity, global equity, and real estate asset classes. Uh, these commitments will range anywhere from $50 million up to a billion dollar uh, commitments. Uh, we truly believe this program will provide a pathway for emerging managers to grow, uh, to become established managers with CalPERS uh, now and into the future. Um, I am, uh, in closing, just want to uh, confirm CalPERS and my commitment to the emerging manager program and its strategies for all the reasons I just discussed. And, and I know time is of the essence, so I'll <laughs> hand it over to, to Lori to provide some more details of the program. Thank you. With your permission, I'll go quickly. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, committee members. My name is Lori Weir, and I'm a senior portfolio manager in CalPERS Investment Office. As Ted indicated, I have the responsibility for CalPERS targeted investment programs, which includes our investments with emerging and diverse managers, as well as our investment office diversity and inclusion initiatives. CalPERS has been recognized throughout the pension world as a leader in investing with emerging managers. It has only been more recently, however, that we have placed more structure, and analysis around these programs to truly understand their role in our investment portfolio in terms of their net asset value, their performance, and the diversity of the managers we work with. These initiatives were captured in CalPERS Emerging Manager Five-Year Plan, which was adopted in 2012 to comply with Senator Curran Price's Bill uh, 294. Also, as required by this legislation, we have delivered two reports to the legislature uh, concerning our progress in implementing this plan across 10 unique work streams. Suffice to say, there is a lot that we could discuss today about this work, but I want to focus on three key things. First, to tell you briefly about data associated with our emerging and diverse manager investments. Second, to provide you with the results of our diversity and inclusion survey undertaken to understand the diversity of the firms that we do business with. And third, to share how we engage with our diverse stakeholders to exchange information and promote opportunities for doing business with CalPERS. So the data, CalPERS invests with over 300 emerging managers, which makes up 35% of all of the external managers in our portfolio. By the way, this is a number that no other pension system can touch. This is the largest number in the United States today for exposure to the sheer number of emerging managers that we work with. Over the course of the last three years, the net asset value managed by emerging managers increased from $10.6 billion to, as Ted referenced, $12 billion today, and we believe this demonstrates CalPERS' strong, ongoing commitment to emerging managers. CalPERS works with 13 African-American-owned firms that are solely owned by African-Americans. CalPERS works with an additional eight firms that have African-American ownership shared with another minority ownership. These uh, are direct relationships 
They're also in what we characterize as a fund of funds. And at times, these are funds underlying, I'm sorry for the technical jargon here, in fund of funds. Importantly, these firms manage approximately over $2 billion of CalPERS capital. Clearly, investment is a core way that CalPERS supports black enterprise. It is important to note that we support diversity and inclusion across our entire enterprise. This includes our external investment managers, our consultants, and our business partners, and our own internal staff. Last year, we conducted a survey amongst our investment managers and consultants to better understand their diversity. We received submissions from 147 companies representing over 51,000 employees. The data showed that 28% of these workers were minority, which is slightly higher than the national figures for the investment industry published by the EEOC. Two minutes to go. African Americans <laughs> made up 5% of workers at firms with CalPERS, which is slightly less than the 66 reported under that EEOC data. The survey also showed that among firms working with CalPERS, Here's the important part. Minorities held more key competency positions. These are associate level, managerial level, and executive level positions than in our nationwide average to which we were compared. I'm going to skip a little bit and talk about our engagement with stakeholders on diversity issues. CalPERS has a long history of hosting and participating in industry associations and stakeholder events focused on emerging and diverse managers. We engage closely with the New America Alliance, the National Association of Securities Professionals, the National Association of Investment Companies, and the Association of Asian American Investment Managers, who all actively participate in emerging and the and emerging and diverse manager community. This calendar year alone, staff has participated in 13 emerging and diverse manager events, and CalPERS remains committed to further strengthening our presence in emerging and diverse manager networks through industry associations and events. And in that vein, please mark your calendars. <laughs> September 10th of this year, we will be hosting CalPERS Diversity and Investment Forum. It will be at the Convention Center. Hmm. Panel discussions will focus on identifying initiatives that will result in increased diversity on corporate boards, executive leadership teams, ownership of external manager firms, and company staff. And that ends my remarks today. I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks. Thank you. Can you give us that date again for the event? September 10th at the Convention Center. Mm -hmm. It's an all-day-long event, and you are invited. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you very much. Um, next is a lady that has um, that I've had an opportunity to meet and, and, and have some discussion with. So, Cynthia Bridges, please take it along. Thank you. Honorable committee chairs and members, uh, can you hear me? <laughs> it is a distinct privilege to come before you to offer testimony on the obstacles and opportunities for black-owned enterprises in California, with specific in emphasis on doing business with the state. As the executive director of the Board of Equalization, I am well aware of the challenges facing business enterprises in California and am pleased to work daily with our BOE staff to ease the state's tax burdens for both large and small businesses. Our elected board members, in association with local elected officials, our sister revenue agencies, and the Small Business Development Administration, regularly conduct outreach seminars for small businesses, women and minority-owned entrepreneurs, and startup companies on everything from compliance to tax exemptions. We also educate minority-owned entrepreneurs and disabled veteran businesses on how to contract with us for goods and services that we need to procure. That being said, there truly is a crisis of underparticipation of African Americans at all levels of the American economy. You have taken a bold step today to highlight this crisis and to seek real answers. 
During my tenure as a tax administrator, as I have traveled the country meeting with other state revenue agencies, business leaders, and elected officials, I was often struck with how little time was spent examining the real state of black enterprise and business opportunities for African Americans. Unfortunately, if questions are asked, the answers are often sought in the media, on TV, talk shows, or on social networks. That's not a criticism. It merely reflects that we live in a world of busy people who focus on doing a good job, albeit without seeking or asking the deeper questions about our society. As a numbers woman I am, um, who has dealt with facts and figures for the majority of my life, um, I had compiled uh, some statistics. However, I will forego that in the essence of time, since uh, several of the uh, panelists um, have covered that already. However, I will reference a 2008 study by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology that mirrors many of my own observations as a revenue administrator, both in California and Louisiana. And that's relative to some factors that may be hindering the growth of black enterprises and, of course, validates much of, the, of today's testimony that you've received thus far. First is lack of access to business capital, either from financial institutions or private resources to support startups or to help black-owned businesses weather economic downturns. The MIT study found that firms owned by African Americans have lower profits and higher closure rates than those owned by whites, and that these disparities are large. For example, in 2006, white-owned firms had average annual sales of $439,579 compared with only $74,018 for black-owned firms. This particular disparity is reflective of American society at large, where data show that African Americans as a group have startling differences in economic status as compared with other groups. U.S. Census Bureau 2011 figures showed that half of all African Americans have less than $6,300 in wealth, and the MIT study shows that wealth levels among whites and Asians are 11 times higher than African Americans. Second is a significant racial disparity in education. The MIT study found that fewer than 20% of blacks have a college education compared with 30% of whites. Asians have the highest levels with nearly 50%, whether born abroad or in the United States. Disparities in education mean reduced access to the knowledge necessary to achieve as entrepreneurs, which leads to ethnic disparities in business outcomes. Third is a reduced intergenerational link in business ownership. Uh, a prime example of that is, of course, Mr. Lacey, who testified earlier. As the MIT study found, the children of business owners are more likely than those of non-business owners to own businesses. Mm -hmm. Working in a family business as a young person often provides the practical knowledge necessary for business success, how to create a business plan, how to budget, how to compete successfully through marketing and customer service. Unfortunately, what we as government administrators, as well as U.S. policymakers face, is the reality of the old proverb, where you stand depends on where you have been sitting. What then is to be done, given these realities and the challenges we face? Let me offer the following recommendations based on my three decades of interacting with businesses of all sizes. First. Be willing to marshal the positive forces of the federal, state, and local governments to encourage and support entrepreneurs. And this is particularly true for emerging black-owned businesses. The Board of Equalization partners with the Franchise Tax Board, the Employment Development Department, the IRS, and the U.S. Small Business Administration to host small business seminars designed to provide the tools for small businesses to learn how to navigate the complex world of tax compliance, as well as how to qualify for a loan, mm -hmm. how to organize their finances, and how to take advantage of the free services from both the public and private sectors to assist their small business growth and development. And many of these workshops are available, um, at least the uh, location and dates and times of these are available on the BOE website. These outreach programs help build trust between business and government and provide the vital bridge between starting a small company and long-term success. 
In addition, the U.S. Small Business Administration offers the 8A Business Development Program to help qualifying minority-owned firms develop and grow their businesses through one-to-one -one counseling, training, workshops, and management and technical guidance. Entrepreneurial mentoring programs such as these must be better supported and publicized by each of us, highlighting that these services are offered to African American businesses and by encouraging participation through our community networks. My personal vision is that our role as government administrators is to offer financial awareness to emerging small businesses through outreach, education, and mentoring. Unfortunately, small businesses, and particularly black-owned businesses, tend to see government as a financial adversary to be avoided rather than a financial mentor to assist. Since I joined the Board of Equalization in 2012, we have used every possible opportunity to publicize that we are here to help. I invite you to join me in getting the word out to emerging black-owned businesses. Our hand remains extended in friendship and partnership. Second, we need to ask honest questions and act on relevant information that enables us to implement programs that actually grow black-owned and minority businesses. For example, we need to expand the outreach of the Small Business and Disabled Veteran Business Enterprise Program that certifies small businesses to sell their goods and services to state agencies. In fiscal year 1314, state agencies spent $2.2 billion in contracts with small businesses and $299 million with disabled veterans enterprises, and roughly 12,500 contracts. But only a small percentage of these are black-owned businesses. The two major hurdles to increasing the number of black-owned businesses that are certified to do business with the state are, first, educating and assisting them on the forms to be filed and the procedures to be followed in order to obtain state contracts. And second, encouraging them to start up or expand their business into the information goods and services vendor pool. While we at BOE increase our contract awards with small business and disabled veteran vendors each year, we always struggle to identify a sufficient number of vendors in the IT goods and services area who are certified to bid on our contracts. A major educational campaign conducted by each state agency is needed to recruit and assist black-owned business entrepreneurs on the tremendous opportunities that exist to contract with us. I am proud to say that for the two previous fiscal years, we don't have the numbers in for this past fiscal year, but our agency um, was able to um, uh, um, provide, uh, I think, 49% in fiscal year 13 and 44% and in fiscal year 14 relative to contracts with small businesses and the veterans uh, program. As a second example, we need to examine the effectiveness of tax incentives and loan and credit line guarantee programs that actually exist responsibly run small businesses in the African American community, which face the challenge of reduced access to capital. Let's get the data to address whether the programs being funded are really working. Have enterprise zones nationwide resulted in the formation of successful African American small businesses and other minority owned small businesses? Have loan guarantee programs, such as the California Small Business Loan Guarantee Program, which allows financial development corps to issue a state guarantee of 80 to 90 percent of the loan, actually assisted African American owned businesses or other minority owned businesses? Have tax incentive and tax forgiveness programs, such as the Startup New York, which offers tax forgiveness for up to 10 years for new businesses under certain circumstances, work to create and grow? African-American-owned businesses and other minority-owned businesses. If the data in the quest, this quest supports the results, then these programs should continue and expand their focus on the African-American community. But if the data shows that the results are below the level and quality expected and the return on the public's investment is low, then we need to advocate for changes. Changes that meet or exceed expectations in terms of recruiting, encouraging, and growing African-American businesses should be the benchmark if funding of these programs continue. So I commend you on seeking contributions from other African-American leaders familiar with the data who also have observed the experience of African-American businesses firsthand. 
Third, all solutions must be built upon a positive narrative. We must champion and highlight success stories and above all, support and publicize African American men and women who have built their own success stories despite the statistics, as evidenced by many of the testimony, much of the okay. testimony and today. You do wrap up. And so I am going to go ahead and wrap it up. I, I in conclusion. I hope that you will continue to call upon the BOE as a resource and to partner with you in spreading the word at that hope and opportunity for all uh, must be a daily occurrence. And I thank you again for this opportunity to address the committees. Thank you, Ms. Bridges. And um, we're going to have uh, uh, the chair of Business and Professions Committee who just joined us, Ms. Bonilla, if you would like to say a few words. Um, well, it is an honor to be here. I apologize for my late arrival. I was stuck presenting bills in multiple committees today, as most of us are. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to prepare the information and the presentations. I want to thank everyone who worked very hard to bring um, this talk topic before us and the Legislative Black Caucus in particular. And I'm very hopeful that we're going to see some meaningful um, policy, as I'm sure we will, move forward from the information that's been shared uh, today. Um, as Chair of Business and Professions, we uh, uh, oversee uh, all the boards and uh, various bureaus that have, have uh, thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of licensed um, uh, professions in our state. And we're always looking for ways to try to remove barriers um, so people can uh, get into the profession and be successful, uh, making sure that the boards and bureaus are serving uh, their constituency, which are the license holders. So. Um, as you continue to look at this issue, uh, if there are particular, you know, focuses, I would really be invite and be interested in hearing, um, you know, from uh, uh, any of the participants in today and, and what if there are any particular needs that we could do in the Department of Consumer Affairs, uh, which is overarching all of the, the boards and bureaus uh, that we uh, see, because there are real opportunities to um, a review regulations to streamline them to make it more effective for people to actually procure that license uh, so that they can uh, function in their chosen profession. And then we also do um, a lot of work around um, just the expansion of various uh, license uh, licenses as well and uh, working to make sure that all of education is tracking into these various fields. So um, thank you uh, very much and it's great to be able to work together on these issues and uh, one of the big issues we've been working on the last two years was yeah. franchises right. and uh, trying to make sure those were functioning well and uh, for the franchise owners. So thank you again. It's a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank Ms. Bonilla for being here. And before you, before you got here, because we all were going back. In fact, I was late getting here. Um, I, if I were to sum up, there were there was like two or three kind of points that were that were made about impediments to for for black businesses to succeed here in California. Um, one that is almost every committee or every panel said was access to capital mm -hmm. and uh, an inability for African Americans to. to try to get startup money, whether it's the SBA, um, where most small businesses are 150000 but SBA's number is at 450000 and and for, e for them to even start. Um, the other is education, of course, and being able to educate uh, the, the workforce so we can be there. And, and, the, and as Mr. Uh, Gibson, who was here earlier, said, and the big elephant in the room is Proposition 209, mm -hmm. which um, many of us believe has been... Um, kind of a, a, a beacon to stop um, uh, women, minorities, and, and others from me actually getting into not only the workforce, being able to start their businesses. And so um, as we start looking at contracting with the state, for example, and getting those numbers up, mm -hmm. because a lot of businesses, that's how they get their startup, mm -hmm. either through government, and then hopefully they, they can expand and then and start from and become a prime one day and be able to, to take on larger, larger contracts. And and, uh, and so um, we lost a lot of our members, but just about every member on all three committees showed up, okay. and and it was it's really great because it, because whatever we move forward with, we need your committee. Right. We need Mr. Eduardo um, Garcia's committee to be able to move things forward, and it looks like we probably need to add another committee called Banking and Finance. Um, to, to, to flush out um, even that tranche of it. 
Um, but if Ms. Weber, did you want to say a few words? Uh, yeah, I too, like everybody else, has been in a, uh, I can't tell you how many hearings a day on, on how many committees all day long. But I knew that this was taking place, and I knew the agenda was very rich, and, and my staff has been monitoring uh, the hearing all day listening. So it's it's really good to hear what's here. I think uh, we have... I, we really haven't learned anything new uh, because we've had this ongoing challenge is how do we uh, increase the participation of the African-American community in the business life of California, particularly California, because of Prop 209. And I think all of us have seen the devastating effect of 209 in local areas in terms of the local states, uh, in terms of business interests, admissions to universities, you can go on and on and on. And it has really had a devastating effect where uh, I know in the city of San Diego we saw uh, doing Prop 209 like a 25 percent. We had 25 percent participation in all business contracts, and then it went down to like 1% uh, mm -hmm. as, after Prop 209 came into effect. After, after a number of years, it was down to 1% and 2%. And, uh, and so that has been devastating to look at it. And, of course, even in the issue of, of creating diversity and inclusion, oftentimes that terminology does not include African Americans. Uh, so that as numbers continue to increase in various areas, uh, we find that inclusion becomes a whole lot of different definitions, but somehow the African Americans don't seem to fit in that definition in terms of increase of individuals' and participation. So there's an ongoing challenge, an ongoing crisis in California, particularly in California, more than some of the other states that still have affirmative action programs, still have various outreach programs. So we have, find ourselves having to be much more innovative and creative and and try to use every tool possible, whether it's looking at small business enterprises, looking at businesses that hire folks in certain zip codes. I mean, I was chair of CEOC in, in, for the city of San Diego and of the commission, and I'm telling you, we tried every trick in the book. We finally and slowly moved the numbers up, but we found a lot of it had to do with the will and the commitment of individuals who were at the top of the agencies to do that. Uh, we had one particular agency, I think it's our tax assessor, who had probably one of the highest rate of employment of people of color and businesses because he had a strong commitment and he had an extremely diverse staff that was highly qualified. But that was his commitment. And when other agencies asked him, how did you do this? He said, I was very committed to making it happen. And it didn't happen on its own. It required the focus and energy. And I think we have to say that to many of our directors and program directors and contractors and others, that when you have the will, it happens. But it will not happen without it. And that's real clear that it just does not happen by osmosis. It is because some director, some program director, some contractor has made up his or her mind that they're going to have a diverse working staff, and they include African Americans and Latinos and everyone else. And then it happens because the people are there and they're available. But it will not happen on its own. And uh, and I think that's extremely important. So it's it's good that all of you've come and brought a number of wonderful suggestions and workshops and seminars and outreach programs that I can tell you without the will. Uh, we've had a lot of these programs before. It will not happen. Thank you for coming, though. Okay. And and um, most of the people who probably had a lot of questions probably are trying to get their bills through committee. Um, and so I want to want to thank you for coming. But I do want to make sure, because this is an official um, assembly committee meeting, um, that we do invite people who have, may have some public comment to to come forward. Thank you. Is there anyone with any public comment? The fewer the people you get, I'm waiting to see how many people show up, whether or not it's one minute or two minutes. Great. Hi, my name is uh, Mitch Harden. I'm one of the lead advisors in Contra Costa County as okay. a uh, two minutes, two minutes, <laughs> uh, a small business development center as well in San Francisco. Uh, one of the things that I heard was outreach. Um, we at Contra Costa County have an outreach program where we are providing training, uh, business planning, uh, customer identity, uh, mission and vision, uh, um, also certification. But there again, you know, the outreach to the community, it's not there. You know, how do we get it to the masses so they know that we're providing these particular training? But that's in Contra Costa County. It's a little different in San Francisco because of the different demographics in terms of business. And so uh, reaching out to this local agencies like SBA and SBDC to access how things are going can also help your committee in deciding some of the funds that can go for in terms of the outreach. 
if you want to do that. And my name is Mitch Harden, and so you can just look me up over there if you need any, if you have any questions for me. We sure will. Thank you, okay. Mr. Harden. Is there any other public comment? Well, I want to thank everyone for coming out. We're, we're about 20 minutes past our time, and we're about 22 minutes past our time. Come on. <laughs> My name is Che Albari with JC Professional Services, and um, I wanted to touch on something that you had mentioned about reaching out to the, the at-risk youth in some of our communities that are already entrepreneurs. Um, we are trying to do that through JC Professional Services and also the Anthony Newman Morris Foundation, a, found, uh, a nonprofit organization that I've started. So uh, I'd like to touch on that and just uh, let you know that we're trying, to, we're trying to work it out right now. And I'm also with Mitch Harding, who is uh, one of my SBDC um, advisors, That's helping great. me with my business. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Um, one of the things we're, we're going to have to, and I think I'm going to follow up, and I think Ms. Brown, who's the chair of this committee, going to follow up on. We, there were some, some interesting things that were said by Mr. Lacey and Mr. Burnett, who are African-American entrepreneurs. Um, we've been trying to do this from government on down, or we talk to employees on up, but we've never talked to the people who employ people. And I, I, I think I, will I definitely will follow up with the people who own the Burger King, the Frat Burger and the um, Buffalo Wild Wings frat franchise because they say they do hire at-risk youth and, and people. And so what is it that you say to them? How do, when you look them eye to eye, what, what in you that says, you know what, I'm going to take that risk and I'm going to go. And, and, and then when it fails, you don't give up. What is it that makes you come back again and again? Because that's what we're finding, whether it's ho housing, the formerly incarcerated. Um, we have people that don't even want to allow them to live in their place, even though they may have a great job and been working on it for, for a couple of years. Um, once you're incarcerated, which is a lot of African-American males, for example, um, how do we get reacclimated if no one will give them a job and no one will house them? Um, and I think it takes a special kind of individual that can look someone in the eye and know deep down that if you just gave them a chance, they can make it. And so we, we're, we're going to have to figure that out, um, not only for ourselves, but for other businesses to teach them how um, to, to bring those individuals back into, to, into society. And so I, want, I, I personally want to thank you, the California Legislative Black Caucus. Dr. Weber and I, thank you. Thank everyone for coming out. This is just the beginning. This is the first step, the, probably the first hearing we've had in quite some time on African-American businesses. Uh, we'll take this information and maybe hopefully we can publish some kind of white paper of what went on here and then um, talk with some of the presenters about the next steps so that we can get to policies and some budget items, but also how do we talk to the private sector to work with them to, to make things better. So, again, I thank you on behalf of the California Legislative Black Caucus and our chair of the Business uh, Summit, uh, Cheryl Brown. Mm -hmm. Meeting stands.